And again, welcome to Freedom. It is so good to see you here today. And to those of you who are joining us online, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we realize we've got more of a percentage of the church that are having to tune in online for a couple of weeks. And uh, we totally get that. We're just glad that you are dialed in that way. Normally at this time, I'd be inviting our children to follow Miss Lynn around to Kids World, but we're not going to do that today for uh, one week, hopefully one week only. We have had to suspend Kids World. The truth of the matter is we just have too many staff and volunteers in that department who uh, either currently have COVID or who've had it this week, and so we just didn't want to attempt to try and piece something together that would put anybody at risk, so we'll just call time out for a week. Um, as Stone said, Ministries here are rolling forward despite the pandemic. Uh, we're just trying to, to take some little precautions to, to make people as safe as we can, but we're not going to stop the continuation of ministry over what's happening right now with COVID. Uh, as Stone said, I, I know people are sick of hearing about it. I want to just say a word, hopefully to encourage you and just give you a sense of where we are and how we're treating this. I was, uh, as I was reflecting on how we deal with what's happening right now, I was reminded this week of when I first moved to the Gulf Coast in the late 90s. I've lived in Alabama all my life, but I'd never lived on the coast. And it was a little bit of a wake-up call that a short time after I got here, uh, a hurricane visited here named George. I don't know how many of you remember that one, but it camped here for about three or four days. And it was, it was a bit of a wake-up call, and not too many years behind that, we had visits from some pretty serious other storms, uh, Ivan and Katrina and others. And at first I was shocked by the amount of chaos and damage and disruption that it was caused. But the thing that was even more surprising than that was how quickly the community would just deal with that and just get right back on track and move forward like, in a sense, like nothing had ever happened. And it, it's a little bit weird when you, don't, when you haven't lived here and you come in and you just discover how people learn to roll with it and it doesn't make them go, oh, we're just in despair, we're moving away, we can't handle this, they just cope with it and go on, and a week or two later, life is just back to the way that it needs to be, and I really feel like the Lord just showed me, we need to adapt, adapt and adopt a mindset like that with all this COVID stuff, that our lives are not going to revolve around it, we're going to pay attention, and on occasion, we're going to have to make some little adjustments, but it's not going to be that different than how we are living on the Gulf Coast. We pay attention to the weather. We know what hurricane season is, and we know when one is headed our way. If it gets close enough, if it's bad enough, we may put up some shutters over our windows. We may fill some sandbags. We, we may adjust our schedule a little bit, but we know the storm's going to pass quickly, and we're just going to roll right back on with life, and we're not going to let that cause us to despair or say, we can't live with this. No, we just deal with it, and we go on. And we're going to take that approach around here with how we deal with the pandemic. When, when there's, if there's other surges in the future... Well, if we need to make some little adjustments, we will. If we need to put on masks for a couple of weeks, you'll have the option of doing that. If we you know, have to do something a little bit differently, we will. But we're going to keep chugging and moving forward, and we're not going to let that hinder us. So that's the approach that we're taking. Things like, like shutting this down in the back today, that's a one-week thing. Masks are optional. We'll just continue to move forward. So thanks for how you adapt to that, and we are just going to uh, we're not going to despair because, for one thing, God's given us a prophetic word about these surges, and I, I still hold on to this. I still get excited every time I hear that there's a surge that's taking place because the Lord has spoken a word that every time that there is a surge of this sickness, there is a surge in the heavenlies of a fresh outpouring that the kingdom of heaven is pouring out what we need, and there's a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God that the church is going to be energized. And so can I offer you a, a bit of good news as we start into the new year today? As we've heard enough bad news, I want to start with some good news in 2022. I believe we, we truly see tangible expressions of the kingdom of God uh, experiencing a surge here on earth, and we are seeing that in Nigeria. I talked with Isaiah this week, and he was telling me, that in Nigeria, uh, our campuses there experience something similar to what we do here during the, the holiday season. He said a lot of people travel. They're just a lot of people who are out of church. But he said, we've been blown away by what we've seen even during the holidays. He said last Sunday, when we expected, as usual, you know, in the holidays for so many people to be gone, he said the Sapala campus, for those of you who haven't been around here, we've been able to plant three new campuses of our church in the last year and a half. Sapala is the first one. He said in Sapala last Sunday, they had right at 700 people on campus. 
that's just crazy, hard to imagine during the holidays. He said the two EDA campuses, one that was planted in August and one in October, um, he said in the, the newest campus, the one meeting in the school, that they had 240 people. I've seen video there. I don't know where in the world they put 240 people in their little classroom space. But, and he said in the other, the, the main EDA campus, that I don't know how many total they had, but he said they had 150 children in the, uh, the children's area of the main EDA campus. But the most encouraging thing that he shared, oh yeah, and Lynn, get this. He said, we've decided we're going to have to add some workers in there. So we're adding two more to the two who were in there for the 150 <laughs> children. I'm like, holy mackerel. So there you go. How about three workers and 150 kids joining you next week? But uh, the coolest thing that he shared, and this is the main thing that I wanted to share with you today, is he said, as, a, as he said before, and as I've shared with you before, he said, I, I've been doing this for 20-something years, and I've, you know, I've seen good things, seen God really move, and, and his blessing and people be reached. But he said, I've never experienced revival until I got to be a part of what God started doing through Freedom Church here last year. Now we are, we are truly experiencing revival. And he said, I've never been any, a part of anything like this before, and I just I want to stay in the middle of this. And here's the specific part that really stuck with me. He said, you know, we're working hard, we're reaching out, we're setting goals and praying, and we're believing God. I mean, in, in, both, of the, in both Sapala and in Eda, they have goals of reaching 1,000 people on each of those campuses by different points this summer. Sapala by their second anniversary at the beginning of June, Eda by their first anniversary in August, both trying to reach 1,000 people and making rapid progress toward that. They're really seeking to reach people. And he said, we're working hard toward that, praying toward that. But he said, we're seeing something now this just kind of mind-blowing. He said, you know, we, we've seen a lot of people reached because our people are praying and they're knocking on doors and they're reaching out to their friends and those people are coming. But he said, now we keep hearing testimonies like what we heard this past Sunday of a man who, who stood up and he said, for a year now, all I hear is Freedom Church, Freedom Church, Freedom Church, and all these good things about Freedom Church. But I never came. And he said, God spoke to me in a dream and said, if you want to get your life right, if you want to change, get in church. Go to Freedom Church. And he said, so I'm here today. Isaiah said, we are now seeing more and more people come that we didn't invite. They're sharing testimonies of God speaking to them and God drawing them to the church. And he said, I've never seen this kind of move of the Spirit. That's good stuff. Yes, amen. He also sent uh, an update this week. I mean, th this is pretty mind-boggling to me, too. Uh, if, if you've been around, you'll remember that in October, we decided to proceed with purchasing a little piece of property next to the rented space in Eda to plant. You know, we built a church building for the Sapala campus a year ago. We bought a little piece of property in Eda next to where they're meeting to build another building. We just sent enough money for the land in mid-October. And then at Thanksgiving, we sent some money to begin construction. Well, he sent an update. Now, it's been six or seven weeks since we've sent the, the money for the beginning of construction. Um, Dave, could you just roll us through the pictures that I sent you? In six or seven weeks, this is what's taking shape. That's the main hall that the church will meet in. That's the children's area. Not bad for six or seven weeks. <laughs> now, as I've shared with you before, we're about $20,000 away from having enough resources to finish and furnish and dig a well for the building. We're not going to do a fundraiser for that. I'm going to ask you very simply. There's no pressure involved. First of all, will you just pray for God's provision? And secondly, will you just pray and be open to whether God wants you to do anything toward that? If you want to give something specifically toward that online or with a check, you can just mark Nigeria Project. But $20,000 is the goal to knock that out. There's no doubt God will make a way for us to have this finished before the rainy season comes in May. So anyway, good news right there. Now, shifting gears to uh, what we're going to be talking about for the coming weeks. As I've had some, some weeks to think and meditate on where the Lord's taking us as we begin the year, that's, uh, that's really what's going to, to dominate our attention for the next 15 weeks. We're going to really camp for a long time on one theme. 
And as we begin, I want you to consider this thought. When, when Jesus set out to reclaim humanity, to reclaim this world for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of darkness had tremendous freedom and the world was in a terrible place. Humanity was at a terrible place. History indicates this in any number of ways. And when Jesus came to set things back in order and reclaim us for the kingdom, he could have done that through a variety of different means. He could have used a, a number of different tactics, and there are some proven ones in history that work really well. If you want to lay claim to a body of people and to gain their allegiance, there are some tried and true ways that have worked for governments, for churches, for generals, and they are things like the use of fear and intimidation. That has worked very well for a lot. The use of authority and power to command allegiance. The use of resources to gain allegiance. If, if you'll support me, here are all the things that I will give to you in return and that's the nature of the relationship Gu guilt and shame can be a great motivating force and jesus rejected all of these he refused to use any of those and instead when he came and when he brought the kingdom of god to earth he chose a completely different way of of connecting us with the kingdom of god and motivating us to connect with the kingdom of god and it's all driven by one thing is driven by love a clear demonstration first of all of God's love for us and then an invitation for us to just love him in response and what's really interesting is that Jesus went to really surprising great lengths to ensure our freedom to choose to choose whether we're going to receive that love whether we're going to respond to that love or reject that love. And I know what I'm saying sounds vague and, and general, but we're going to really dig into this because I want to tell you, it, this is a big deal in terms of you understanding a lot about how you relate to God, in terms of you understanding a lot about what God does and what God does not do. Jesus has worked hard to protect our freedom to choose, including the freedom for us to just turn away, to rebel, to do whatever we want to do, and to respect that freedom. He has chosen to let love drive everything. Why did he do that? He did it, one, because it's his nature. But he also did it because he understands that love is the most powerful force that exists. It is the most powerful motivator that exists. When you love deeply, it will cause you to go to incredible lengths. I mean, think about the things that you as a parent have done and would do for your children for one simple reason you love them i mean how many of us have nearly made ourselves you know work ourselves to death or go broke trying to make sure that our kids were taken care of how many of us would take a bullet before we would let our kids be harmed i mean we would go to such great lengths why because somebody compelled us to because somebody guilted us into it no for one simple reason we love them and that's how love behaves everything in the kingdom of god revolves around that one thing it's all about love well i start at that point because i am convinced of this when you think about your life and and how you behave as a follower of christ how you live as a christian how do you get from where you are to a place where where you've made real progress as a christian i mean when i've thought about what are my goals for this year and I think I may have said it in the Wednesday Word this week. But my chief goal this year is a really simple one. I want to be a better Christian. I want to be a better follower of Jesus. I really want to be just more in step with Him. And here's what I believe about that. There's just one key above everything else to doing that. And that is to love Him more. Because the more that you love him, the less you're going to have to try and learn to make yourself do these things as a force of habit or will or whatever, the more natural they're going to become. Because when you love someone, 
it's just hard to want to get out of step with doing whatever it is that's going to honor them and please them and keep you close to them. And here's the wonderful thing. It's a given. If you just can get to know the real Jesus, not some two-dimensional character that we've seen in an old movie, not just some two-dimensional character on the page of a book, but the real, living, personal, creative, powerful, funny, surprising Jesus... You will love him. He's incredible. He's not two-dimensional. I mean, he's beyond three-dimensional. He's so good. There, There is no one you've met. I mean, think about the most compelling, charismatic person that you know, the person that you just enjoy being in their presence more than anyone else. You'll enjoy Jesus more than you enjoy them. And so here's our goal as we dive into the next 15 weeks that we will get to know Jesus like we have never known him before. How's that for a New Year's goal? I think that's a good plan. How about you? That, that's the goal. It is that simple. And pretty much everything that we do at Freedom Church in the coming weeks, it's going to be about that one simple thing. It's all you're going to hear me preach about for the next three and a half months is just getting to know Jesus. In every 242 group meeting, it's going to be about getting to know Jesus. As you take part in the daily church-wide Bible reading plan, Starting right now, you're going to be reading through Matthew's gospel account, just getting to know Jesus. The next 15 weeks, I'm just going to preach out of Matthew the entire time, getting to know Jesus as he shared through the gospels and specifically through Matthew. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me, if you will now, to Matthew. And we don't have time in 15 weeks to cover 28 chapters of Matthew, but we are going to hit a lot of the really important portions. And I'm intentionally going to bite off more in terms of scripture on Sundays than I have time to preach But it's because I believe in the importance of us hearing the Word, reading the Word together, and you'll be able to dive into this more deeply in your small group time. We're going to begin today in Matthew 3, partly because we already did Matthew 1 and 2 during the the holidays. As we were considering the Christmas story, we've already been in Matthew 1 and 2. So in Matthew 3, we fast forward a bit from Jesus' birth and infancy all the way to his adult life and ministry and so we've jumped forward about 30 years and Matthew begins in verse 1 of of chapter 3 by saying in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near now remember if you were with us at the beginning of December John the Baptist is a really important character the Jewish people who is it that they've been looking for well yes deep down inside they've been looking for the Messiah but who are they really watching for they've been watching for the prophet They don't have to watch for the Messiah because the prophet's going to come first. So if we recognize Elijah, as the Old Testament has said, he's going to come, then we'll know the Messiah's right behind him. John the Baptist is that appearance of somebody in the spirit and power of Elijah. So Matthew begins with John's ministry. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Now, it's not quite as creepy as it sounds. He wasn't eating bugs every day. I didn't know this until I was in the the Holy Land, but they have trees that grow these uh, wild green beans that they refer to as locusts, so it's just, it's a wild green thing that he could eat. That sounds kind of creepy, though, locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Just for a second, consider the weight of those couple of verses. For 400 years, the voice of the Lord has been essentially silent for the people of God. It has been a very difficult season. The Old Testament canon has been closed, and they are just waiting, waiting, waiting. And the first time that we really see the Spirit of God moving in a way that is noticeable among the people of God that there is really a movement afoot, is this. John, this, this kind of wild preacher who's, who's dressed kind of wildly. It, in um, the, uh, the Chosen, they refer to him as Creepy John. He, he is really an extraordinary character. And he's preaching in the wilderness region, and masses of people are coming to him. We don't know how long his ministry lasted, if it was uh, several weeks, a few months, a couple of years. But there's, there's a real movement taking place as people who are hungry for something from God, 
come to John and they're asking to be baptized as they respond to his preaching. Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. See, he's already turning the light in a different direction from himself. He will baptize you with Holy, the Holy Spirit and with fire. Somebody say amen to that. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So you, do you get a little bit of the flavor of John's ministry? He's preaching a hard message when the religious elite show up, and they've had to journey a ways from Jerusalem to go up to the, the area of the wilderness where John's baptizing at the Jordan. And he does not give them a warm reception, does he? I mean, when I was in seminary, and you know, they're having you read all the books on church growth and how to reach more people. I want to tell you, the preaching of John the Baptist doesn't show up in any of those books. It does not. This is not how you add to the masses that are coming to you under normal circumstances to look at, at the religious elite who walk in the door and say, you bunch of snakes, who told you to come in here? God's already got the ax at the root of the trees and he's ready to chop you down. He's ready to just cut you off at the knees. It's a hard message. He's saying you better change your ways. But the other half of his message is not just a call to repentance. It is, he, he understands, he has the ministry, he has the ministry of the forerunner. That is not about him, it's about the one who's coming after him. He already recognizes that the Messiah is about to appear, and he is saying, I'm telling you guys, prepare yourselves, prepare your hearts, because there is one coming, and he is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and I can't even tell you what's coming after that. That's the ministry of the forerunner. Verse 13, then, and only then, Jesus came from Galilee, way up in the north, down to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Don't you know he felt that very deeply? I mean, can you imagine Jesus showing up and saying, uh, why don't you baptize me? What do you mean, Jesus? You're the one who should be doing the baptizing. And Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness and then John consented, and he baptized Jesus. Don't miss this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I want you to just think about the importance and the power of this moment. I mean, Jesus has been perfectly doing the will of his Father for 30 years, but he's been living in total obscurity the whole time. He's just learning to walk and talk and be a faithful son and learning to hammer a nail. I mean, he, he's just learning the basics of life, and, and then he's learning the Scriptures, and he's learning how to function as an adult and as a follower of the one true God. But nobody knows who he is outside of Nazareth. He's wrestling with this sense of knowing that he has a unique calling, that he's called to be the Savior of the world, and what's that going to look like? And something has stirred in him, calling him to finally leave the little mountain village that he's lived in for most of his 30 years here on earth and to go and to check out this thing that he's heard about. He's probably read about it on Facebook. There's this, this movement that's happening down at the Jordan, and he's got to go see it for himself. And he gets there, and he feels absolutely compelled that he is supposed to join the masses who are standing in line to be baptized in the river by John. Now, for Jewish people in the first century, just like Jews for hundreds of years before them, baptism didn't mean exactly what it does for us, but it wasn't that far off. Baptism was, in part, it was a ritual cleansing thing. It was a public acknowledgment of, I am a sinful person who needs cleansing and forgiveness from God. It was a way of saying, I want to identify with God and with His people. I need a fresh start, and I want to be baptized 
and be a new person from this point forward. And so in one sense, it's a bit of a confusing thing because Jesus doesn't need a new start and he doesn't need sins forgiven. And yet he feels like it's vitally important to step into what's happening here this day. And we might go, well, okay, he's going to do it, but how big of a deal is it? It's such a big deal that in the moment that he comes up out of the water, the heavens open up, and for the first time apparently in Jesus' life, the Holy Spirit is poured out in power on him, and he now possesses all the power of God to operate in miraculous ways every day here on earth. And as if that is not enough to mark the moment, The Father himself thunders from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son. I love him. I am well pleased with his life. Something big just happened. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, my goodness. If this happened to you after you just did something and you get this kind of outpouring and the Father thunders from heaven, don't you think you just did something that was a pretty big deal? A big deal has just happened. Now what happens next? The curtain is about to go up on Jesus' ministry. So what's the Spirit going to lead him to do now that it's time to go public? What's the first thing the Holy Spirit is going to have for Jesus? Does he start preaching? Does he start healing? What does he do? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Whoa. Didn't see that one coming, did you? I mean, this is the first thing that the Spirit of God is going to lead Jesus to do now that he launches his ministry, is go get alone for a long time. Well, not totally alone, because the devil's going to be there. Is that not a little surprising for you? And yet, that's the first thing the Spirit leads him to do. Jesus fasts for an extended period, and he is in a brutal region. I've been to where they believe that Jesus went for this period, and it is as rugged and barren as anything that you can imagine. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So then the devil took him to the holy city, and he had him stand on the highest point of the temple, where the The royal porch and Solomon's porch meet. There is a peak that is 450 feet above the brook of Kidron down in the Kidron Valley. It's the highest point, and it it would be a spectacular thing to stand there. But if you could imagine stepping off of that 450 feet straight down, it would be such a spectacular show to do that and to have angels come in and rescue Jesus. And that's the picture that Satan conjures up. As you're launching your ministry... There's nothing that's going to get people's attention faster than for you to go to the holy city, to the highest point, let a crowd watch, and while they think you may be a lunatic about to commit suicide, when they see you step off, and as you're going down, you know there's no way the Father's going to let you hit the bottom. When they see angels come and rescue you, it is on then, big boy. You just go do that. That show will bring a crowd like nothing else. And don't you know it would? That's what he's asking him to do. He says, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. See, Jesus, you'll basically be showing the people what the Scriptures have promised. You'll be showing them that in real life. So come on, make it happen. And Jesus answered him, It's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this... I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, we may look at that and say, how tempting is that? The world belongs to God, not to Satan. But understand the depth of what Satan is saying. He has been loose with very little limitation here on the earth. And essentially what Satan is saying is, I understand why you're here, and you understand why you're here, and it is so that you can reclaim all of this planet and all of the people on it from my influence. And I'm telling you, I'll give it up. I'll give it up today if you'll just bow down and worship me. Tell me that that wouldn't be tempting when in your heart you know how costly this is going to be. But Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, 
and angels came and attended him. Another of the gospel writers says uh, of this moment, the devil left him until a more opportune time, which is a really interesting little insight. Satan's not done. That was just round one. It's like, oh, oh I'll be back. Rest assured, I'm going to keep doing everything I can to kill you, to trip you up. But for today, you, you won round one. And angels came and attended to Jesus. I'd love to, to have witnessed that. Verse 12, apparently following that experience in the wilderness, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. It, it's easy to run past that and just see it as a connecting verse, but oh, it's an important verse. John's never going to emerge from prison. John's going to have his head chopped off in prison. He's going to languish there for quite a time. He's going to have a lot of questions and struggles as he suffers in prison, and then he's going to be murdered. When Jesus came back from the wilderness, he heard that his friend and his relative, who was the same age, maybe six months older than Jesus, he heard that he had been locked up. He withdrew from that region, and he went back to where he came from in Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, which is where he had grown up, where he had been living as an adult, he went and lived in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You ever been to a concert and you came for a big time artist or a big time band or maybe you went to, to hear a, you know, a big time comedian, but what always precedes the big name? There's always the cover band, right? There's always the the other, the no-name comedian, the, the, the no-name band. You, you're going to listen to their stuff, and half the seats are going to be empty during theirs because there's always a setup to the main event, right? Well, John's the cover band. John is the, he is the setup to the main event. And Jesus understood this. John's ministry was very important. When you really read the Gospels, paying attention to John's ministry, he plays a big role, but he was always setting the stage for the Messiah to then step in kind of onto his shoulders and do the most important thing that had ever happened in history. Jesus, after 30 years of living in obscurity, the curtain is going to lift on the main act. What is that going to look like? What is going to be the nature of his ministry? We get our very first look at God in the flesh, a living, breathing adult, and you know one of the very first things that we discover about him? He struggles with temptation just like we do. He's really tempted by sin. Satan plagues him. Satan attacks him. He has to deal with real stuff just like we do. And he has to wrestle with and come to terms with, how am I going to do ministry that's really going to bring the kingdom of God into the lives of people here on earth? And today we get our first glimpse of Jesus. Now, there are so many things in this passage that we don't have time to cover today, but there are four life principles, four really important truths that I want you to, to take notice of. If you want to pull out your outlines and follow along, just to help you remember, the four things that I want you to notice from this passage today starts with number one. We learn from Jesus in this passage that obedience and connection precede spiritual anointing. Okay, that may sound like a, a vague notion. Let, let's consider that for a moment obedience and connection precede spiritual anointing why does any of that matter to us how many of us in the room how many of you watching online want to live in a place where spiritual anointing would be a good phrase to describe your life where you operate under the leadership and power and wisdom of the holy spirit how many want that i want it give me a double dose of it i want spiritual anointing it doesn't just come in a vacuum and it doesn't come under just any and every circumstance. Jesus shows us, through his example, two things clearly preceded him stepping into the spiritual anointing. I mean, it, it's literal. It's, it's a, this tangible thing. John got to witness it. If you read all the gospel accounts, John gets to see the Holy Spirit 
I mean, it's not like we have to see it, but it's, it's like, okay, as we're starting the process of you understanding the work of the Holy Spirit, we're going to let him come in a visible form. It's going to look like a dove coming down and lighting on Jesus. It is the Spirit of God going, boom, resting on one person in the whole crowd. And when that happens, Jesus now possesses insight directly from the Father. He possesses supernatural power. There's all of this stuff that comes with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this approval from, from heaven. But what immediately preceded that? It's not random. I know it's not random. His baptism. Don't miss this. What happened at Jesus' baptism that positioned him so that this would be the moment? It's about obedience and it's about connection. Jesus didn't need to get saved and to be baptized so that he could say to the world, my sins have been washed away. No, no, no. First of all, he's obeying the promptings of the Father because there is nothing on earth that would naturally say, Jesus, sinless Son of God, you need to be baptized. No, the traditions of the Jews would not indicate Jesus needed to be baptized. The only guy on earth without sin doesn't need to be baptized for the conventional reasons. And yet the Father had prompted him to go and do this. I mean, even John is going, no, don't. We this isn't right. This doesn't feel right at all. And Jesus said, no, we've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. It's the right thing to do. I know I'm supposed to do this. Why? Obviously, because the Father has prompted me. I've been living in obscurity all this time, and I need to step into what is happening here. Please, John, I need you. I want you to baptize me. Well, what is Jesus' baptiz baptism all about? More than anything. It is about identifying with the people of God and this fresh movement of God among his people. Understand, as Jesus inaugurated baptism as a, a practice of the New Testament church, baptism is about connection. You get baptized into the church. You get baptized into the fellowship. There's nobody today who, who struggles with this more than the Western church does. Eastern minds, Eastern thinkers, we're talking about in Asia and, and in Africa, and all, they think communally, they, they think almost always in terms of how they fit into the community, and we think individually. It's just, it's who we are, it's part of the Western and American ideal. It's all about me and what I do and the decisions I make and pulling myself up by my bootstraps. It's all about me and Jesus, me and Jesus. And we struggle with the most fundamental concept of Christianity. You are invited to belong to the family of God. That is God's great invitation. You are not invited into a solo relationship with God. That was never God's plan. Baptism is a way of clearly stepping into the community of faith. Jesus is identifying with these people who are hungry for God. They want a fresh start. They want to make a change. And Jesus is saying, and I'm a part of this movement. I'm stepping into the middle of this movement. Baptism, obedience, connection is a key piece. I've observed a trend in my lifetime, and I bet you've seen the same thing that I have, and it's a disturbing trend. Among Christians today, and, and here I'm speaking of what we know, I'm speaking of the church in the West, two major trends that I have observed. We do not think it's important to be baptized, and we do not think it's important to have to belong to a church. And those are growing trends. I'll go a step beyond what I just said. Not only do we not think it's important to be baptized, it is difficult to convince a Christian to ever be baptized. It's like, that, it's just a symbol, it's not that big of a deal, why do I need to do that? I mean, it's, it's really a challenge to persuade somebody that as a follower of Jesus, that baptism is something that we should do. And beyond that, as you well know, it is an in ever-increasing challenge to convince people that it really matters that they actually belong to a church. Now look, I know a bunch of you who are watching and listening to this online right now are doing it the way that you're doing it because of COVID-19 and the current surge and all of that. Totally get that. That's fine. But do not let this become a substitute for belonging to a local church. This has become way too much the norm. Jesus paid the price that he did on the cross, not just so your sins could be forgiven and you could have a relationship with God, but so that you could belong to the family of God, and that is expressed through the local church. 
There is no real reason for God to pour out His Spirit and anointing on your life or mine if I'm not committed to obedience and connection in the local church. The Spirit of God and the gifts of the Spirit of God, we don't have time to delve into this, but we could at great length, is specifically tied to equipping and empowering us to use those gifts in the life of the local church. It's not primarily about making you a better plumber or a better housekeeper or a better teacher. It, it's not, I mean, can it do that? Yes, but that's not primarily what it's designed to do. You study the work of the gifts of the Spirit in our lives. It is about how we function within the church. If we're not going to be obedient to what God has called us to do, and if we're not going to connect to his family, there's really no reason for God to pour out his anointing on us. Obedience and connection precede a life of great spiritual anointing. And in case we aren't convinced from what happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, I would remind you of in Acts 2. You remember the day of Pentecost when Peter has preached now in the power of the Holy Spirit? Thousands in Jerusalem have listened to this. The Spirit of God has cut them to the quick. They, they are truly grieved. And, and they say, brothers, what should we do then? In light of the truth that you've told us, what should we do? In Acts 2.38, here's how Peter answers the question. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Sounds like Peter just said again exactly what Jesus experienced. You want to get on this train, there are some things that you've got to do. You've got to be committed to obedience and committed to this connection. The second truth that I see in this passage is, is this, that a great calling comes with temptation toward great compromise. I just find it so interesting that Jesus, at the very outset of his public ministry, as the curtain goes up, it's like Jesus leaves the stage. The Spirit has just come on Jesus. The voice of the Father thunders his approval. The curtain rises. Only in time to see Jesus back as he exits the stage and goes to the wilderness for 40 days. What on earth is happening here? He just left for basic training. You know, we're never going to send anybody out to the front lines in our military until we have sent them through the rigors of basic training. It's like the military has got to break you down to build you back up for you to be equipped for what you're going to have to face out there on the lines. And Jesus, now that he possesses the Holy Spirit, he is equipped to now begin to step into that level of testing and training. And by the way, that word where it says the Spirit led him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, that word also means literally, it's just as, as fair of a translation, to be tested by the devil. The Spirit's not leading him to a place to get him off course. It's leading him to a place where he's going to be stretched and pushed to the limit so that he is equipped for the things that are going to lie before him in the next three and a half years. A great calling comes with temptation toward great compromise, and Jesus experienced that to its fullest. Hebrews 4.15 reminds us that when Jesus lived on earth, he was tempted in every way. He was tempted in the same ways that we are tempted, but he never sinned. Does that comfort you? It's not a trick question. Does that comfort you? It does me. I mean, Jesus is our go-between. Jesus is our advocate. He is our defense attorney before the Father. When we are struggling, Jesus can literally say, Father, I remember how bad it is. It is so hard. I remember that stage of life. I remember facing that. Please give them what they need. Help them right now. This is what they're going to need. That's comforting to know that, that he feels our pain and our struggle. Now, I'm not going to take long on this, but I do want to point out, because we want to know Jesus in this. The three temptations that Satan put before Jesus, when you really start scratching around there, at first they become more perplexing. Because, I mean, think about the nature of the temptations. The first one, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, and, and, and it says, and after 40 days he got hungry, and some of us read that and go, well, Matthew, that's an understatement, dude. You know, 40 days, I imagine he's hungry. But actually, the, there is some real logic to what he said. If you've ever done an extended fast, yes, you're hungry to begin with, but after the first few days, hunger goes away completely when your body shifts over and it starts feeding on stored energy reserves, and you don't feel hunger. 
after just a few days, you don't feel hunger basically at all for anywhere from about three to, to uh, five weeks in there. You won't feel hunger pains. And then when your body uses up its stored reserves and it starts devouring healthy tissue, you'll suddenly feel hungry again and you need to break the fast because it's no longer a healthy thing. So Matthew's not playing with us when he says, and after 40 days he was hungry. Jesus had used up all of his reserves, and now he's hungry again. He hadn't been dealing with hunger for a while, but now he's hungry again. And Satan shows up and says, hey, big boy, you know what you ought to do? You, you've been wrestling with coming to terms with how to save the world. you got the Holy Spirit. you got this power and all. Why don't you start with a little trial run? It'd be smart to do it when you're by yourself because, I mean, you don't want to mess up in front of a crowd. So here's a good thing to do. You see those rocks over there? What's it look like to you? Kind of looks like a loaf of bread, doesn't it? I know you're hungry. Why don't you just turn a couple of those into some bread? It's not going to hurt anything, is it? I mean, you're hungry. You need some food. Make some bread. Now, on the surface of that, don't you feel like, well, why didn't Jesus just do it? I mean, he is hungry, and he needs bread, and he's got the power. What's going to be hurt by making stones into bread? And in one sense, it wouldn't have been, it's not evil to turn a stone into bread. And in fact, there are going to be two times in Jesus' ministry where Jesus supernaturally multiplies bread to feed people. And yet he realizes that is not supposed, how I'm supposed to use my power today is to turn stones into bread. We're going to come back to that in just a second. The next thing that Satan says is, well, how about this? Let's get in the middle of the holy city. Let's get a crowd. Let's put on a show. You've been wrestling with how to begin your ministry it's going to start it with a bang. They're going to realize the Messiah has come. They're going to recognize you so much faster if you'll do miracles to wow the crowd. Well, again, at a first glance, doesn't that seem to sort of make sense? I mean, Jesus is going to do a lot of miracles. It is going to attract a lot of attention. I mean, wouldn't that be uh, one way to, to gather the attention of people and to gather a following? What is it that Satan is really doing that is an attempt to get Jesus off course? It is all about the heart of Jesus' ministry. And what is really going to drive this movement of the, of the kingdom of God here on earth? Remember where we started. For Jesus, having considered all of the ways that people draw people in, connect with them, and lead them, he realized that there was only one right motive to operate from. Jesus lived when the Romans were in power. And you, I'm sure you've heard the phrase before. You remember how the, the Romans kept people under their control and kept them sort of pacified so that they would be good subjects of Rome? You remember the, the two things? Bread and circuses. You've heard that phrase before? Bread and circuses? Do you know what the phrase is about? If you give people these two things, you pretty much can keep them in line. You can keep them following you. First of all, give them bread. Give them what they need. They, they, they need to depend on you, so give them enough of what they need that they don't get unruly. If they don't have enough to eat, they're going to get out of control. So, so give them the bread that they want. The first temptation is, Jesus, you could be a bread messiah. Just give, give, give to people. Let this be the, the nature of your relationship with them every time they need something you just give them what they need give them what they ask for by the way this is the appeal and the error of the modern name it and claim it movement in the church it is redefining the nature of the relationship that we have with god if you belong to god he should have to give you whatever you ask for every time you ask for if you ask in faith you're going to get it you're going to get it going to get it because god has to supply everything that you ask for Jesus is our great reward, not the bread that we get. This promise of constant health, wealth, and prosperity is yielding to the initial temptations that Jesus had to face, that God himself is not a great enough reward. Jesus, you could be a bread messiah. Well, but it's not just bread. It's bread and circuses. What are circuses? Circuses is about putting on a show for the people entertaining the people, appealing to that side of the people. The Romans understood this. If we give them bread and circuses, they'll stay subject to us. That plus fear. It'll do the trick. Jesus, you can provide the show. Oh, like nobody before, you can provide the show. You've got miraculous power. Use it. 
Friends, tragically, not just dictators, not just governmental powers, but the church for significant periods of history have taken the world's and Satan's methods of leading and controlling the masses and have used things other than Jesus' motives. We're going to promise you what you're going to get. If you just name it and you claim it, you're going to get it. You're going to get all that you want. You're going to get every prayer answered. No, you're not. Not the way you want it. You're not going to get everything you ask for. You're not going to get everything that you pray for. It is not the nature of the relationship that we have with God here on earth. Jesus could have, could have lived out a ministry that was all about, I'm just going to be making bread and meat all the time. I'm going to be feeding everybody who's hungry every day. I'm going to be just being so putting on a public spectacle. I'm going to buy a white suit. I'm going to be on stage all the time. I'm going to wow people by bringing people up and getting them out of the wheelchair, getting them off the crutches, making all this stuff happen in front of a crowd. I'm going to put on the show, and that's going to bring in their allegiance. And Jesus rejected that was not the nature of his ministry and we may look at that and go but jesus did do miracles he did use his power to help people yes he did and what's the first thing he said to virtually everyone that he miraculously healed exactly time after time after time he would do the miraculous he would meet a very deep personal need and immediately he would say don't tell anyone don't tell anyone who did this go show yourself to the priest you pay the the gift that that you owe and then you just keep it to yourself. Why? Because it is the nature of Jesus' ministry that it is all built around a love relationship. I mean, this should force us. I expect you to walk out today scratching your head a little bit over some of what I'm talking about going, I'm not sure I got all of what he was alluding to. I don't expect you to. I don't get all of it. Jesus is choosing a way that doesn't fully make sense to us. Jesus is choosing a way that is protecting our freedom to choose whether or not to receive his love and love him back. He is choosing not to give us everything we ask for because he realizes that if we do that, if we get that, it will redefine our relationship with him. It will be all about the stuff. We say, oh no, we would just love him that much more for it. No, you wouldn't. We'd love the stuff more. If he just answered every prayer the way that we asked for, we'd love him that much more. No, we wouldn't. He would become a big slot machine for us, and we'd love the stuff. We'd love the answers more than we would love him. He loves us more than anyone else and invites us just to receive him as our great reward. Now, some of the dimensions of this are going to change when we get with him in heaven, but here on earth, it's really important that we understand the nature of this. Jesus is rejecting these things that are a genuine temptation to compromise how he's supposed to do ministry. And, of course, the final one is a temptation to just completely alter the game plan. Hey, there's an easier way. There's an easier way for you to take the world. Just in a moment of time, worship me. And he says, no, no, no. This is really clear. The Scripture says, love God and serve him only, and I'm not going to even for a moment alter that plan. Well, it's a given that no one can defeat evil by compromising with evil. Thankfully, Jesus got that, because I'm sure it was tempting to think, maybe I could reclaim the whole planet and Satan move on to Mercury or Pluto or some other place and let me claim what I'm supposed to claim here. He understood you can't defeat evil. You can't overcome evil by compromising with evil. Now, I, I'm not going to camp on this, but it, I am going to just point this out just in practical terms. Every great calling, and I f personally I feel like the greater your calling of how God, what God's calling you to and how God wants to use you, it only raises the stakes on the amount that you're going to be tempted. Isn't there something instinctive in you that feels like the more I grow in my relationship with Jesus, the less the temptation should be an issue for me? That seems to make sense, and yet it just doesn't, it isn't borne out in real life, is it? I mean, the spiritual giants in the room can, can tell me I'm off base here, but what I have discovered is it doesn't go away. Temptation doesn't go away. It just changes forms. Jesus had the highest calling of anyone, and he was tempted. We're still tempted. And I just want to point out to you, it seems to me that in our time, there are three very pervasive temptations that we struggle with in our culture, 
in our lifetimes. And, and, and here are the three that I noticed. You could certainly add to this list, but these are three that we need to be really wary of. And the first one is the temptation in regard to honesty. I, I am stunned by the number of Christians today. People I truly consider Christians who feel no obligation to tell the truth. We will lie at the drop of a hat as a matter of convenience. As long as we feel like it doesn't hurt anyone, we will lie, lie, lie. The truth doesn't matter. Jesus said Satan is the father of all lies. Jesus calls himself the truth. And one of the biggest compromises that we are tempted toward is telling the truth only when it's convenient. Well, it would hurt their feelings if I told the truth. I might look bad if I told the truth. We are tempted to compromise about honesty. Secondly, we are tempted to compromise today when it comes to financial matters. We feel like if it happened in cash, then it's not, there's nothing wrong with cheating the government. We can cheat on our taxes, and it's not really cheating. There's nothing wrong with it because we don't like the way they're spending them. They're, they're doing a lousy job of managing the money in Washington, so it's, it's okay for me to cheat on my taxes. Really? We feel like we can fudge on expense reports or what we take home or what we lay claim to or we can withhold the tithe because the Lord knows my heart. My heart's good. When I'm at a better place financially, I'm going to give more. But I, I can with we just feel like we can compromise financially and still expect to get a pass. And the third place where I see where we seem to struggle immensely with temptation is when it comes to inappropriate relationships. We're not married but we love each other, so who could it hurt? I mean, if two people love each other as much as we love each other, why do we have to set boundaries on what we do? We may be married, but we have a love for each other that's not for our spouses. But if we're consenting adults, it's not really hurting anybody. How could this be so wrong? How could it be wrong when it feels so right? We're not actually having sex. We're just connecting online. We're just having this little relationship where we text or whatever. We cannot overcome evil by compromising with evil. And the enemy will start with small things to get us off course. A great calling comes with great temptation. A third truth is simply this. A deep love for God and his word is vital to gaining victory over temptation. Jesus responded to everything that Satan threw at him with scripture. But it wasn't just that he knew the word, which is critically important because Satan even tried to use the word to throw Jesus off. So it is vital to know the word. But the thing that drove Jesus more than anything else was his love for the Father. I mean, Jesus is hungry. Can you imagine how hungry he is? Jackie and I love to watch Survivor, and Survivor takes people 39 days. It's, it's amazing to watch in 39 days how skinny the people are by then, how much they're driven by hunger. Jesus is at the end of 40 days. He is so skinny. He is so hungry. And yet, even in that moment when Satan is going, come on, just make a good loaf of sourdough right there. And Jesus' response of, you know what? Man is not supposed to live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from my Father. You know what that statement is about? It's about how much Jesus loves his Father. Jesus understood that, that fasting is not about misery. Fasting is about feasting. It's about feasting your soul on the goodness of God and the presence of God and God's revelation of himself to us. And what Jesus is saying is, devil, you think I'm so starved here today, but I want you to know I'm the fullest I've been in a long time because I've been with my father for 40 days. My soul is so full. I am so in love with the father. I don't want to play with your stinking tricks. Love for God is the greatest thing that we can have to overcome temptation. We try and, and come up with strategies to overcome everything that we stumble over, and, and that's okay. I mean, building other things in our lives, accountability and the different things that we can do, that, that's all good. But I just want to tell you, there is nothing that's going to be as powerful as falling more in love with Jesus. I want to tell you, I am faithful to my wife. I don't play around in any shape or form with other women i don't privately communicate with other women i don't privately have just safe you know little relationships secretly with other women i don't entertain thoughts of having relationships with other women not because i'm some spiritual giant 
And I'm just going to be honest with you. It's not even primarily because God's word says it's wrong, though it does, and yes, that matters. You know the main reason that I don't consider any other relationship? It's because I love Jackie so much. I cannot stand the thought of dishonoring the woman that I love so much. It would crush me to think of what it would do to her if I fiddled around with an emotional or physical relationship with another woman. See, it's not the rule that even matters here. It's driven by love. And I want to tell you, that is a powerful force in our relationship with God. The better we know Jesus and the more we truly fall in love with him, the easier it is to say, I don't want any part of that. That thing that used to be so tempting, it doesn't look nearly as tempting because of what I share with Jesus. Love is the driving force. The fourth and final thing I'll say is this. The, the last principle or truth is this. That great impact results simply from joining God in what he is doing. I think we, we tend to believe, whether we consciously would say this or not, that we believe that great impact comes from great people. It comes from great passion. It comes from great commitment. It comes from great preparation. It comes from great crowds or great resources. Do, do you know what I'm talking about when I say that? I mean, all of these are components that, like, you get enough people together, and if you're smart enough, and you're passionate enough, and, and if you're, you know, energetic enough and, and charismatic enough, if, if you have enough of that, you could get something great going on. And the thing is, we could point to a lot of examples where we go, that looks pretty great. They got a big crowd, they got a lot of money, they're doing a lot of things, they're building a lot of things, a lot going on there. And it seems like on the surface, if the things that I just named, if you have enough of that in abundance, you can do something great. And I want to tell you, the thing that will define great impact is just whether or not you discovered what God's already doing and you joined him in it. I'm curious, how many of you have ever done, I know it's, this is a little bit dated, but Henry Blackaby's uh, study, Experiencing God, several of you have, it is, it is a profound and life-changing thing. If you've done it, you know the fundamental truth in that is God's always at work and God is always powerfully at work and the trick is to learn to watch for and to recognize what God is doing and the, the voice of God's spirit inviting you to join him in what he's already doing it's the very opposite of just do something and then ask God to bless it no no it's that completely turned around it's watching to see where God is at work and stepping into what he's doing Oh, it makes all the difference in the world. Where do we see this in this story? Oh, it's what the story's all about. The world had been waiting for generations to see God do something significant again, for there to be another movement. And it started with John. This really odd guy that none of us would have chosen. And God starts doing something through him. And people like a magnet are drawn to this. It's like a fire, and people are coming to, to see it and to worm up next to it. And, and it's building, and it's growing, and people are coming from all over to this thing. And when it looks like it's really going to take off, John is pulled out of it. He's arrested, and he's about to be killed. What's Jesus going to do? I'll tell you what Jesus is going to do. He's going to hop on John's shoulders. It's going to take the exact message. Go back and look at it. The opening of Matthew 3 reads word for word like the last verse we read in Matthew 4. What was John preaching? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. It's at hand. It's about to show up at your doorstep right now. What does Jesus immediately do? He just takes the baton from John. Clearly, John's ministry is done, and now I'm going to pick up right where he left off, and I'm going to step right into the exact same movement, and it's going to be the exact word-for-word -word same message, and I'm going to preach this every day that I'm left here on the earth until I get to the cross. Repent. Change how you think. Change what you're holding on to and believe is important because I'm telling you the kingdom of God is here you're looking at it being ushered in. Jesus had been waiting and watching for 30 years, waiting for the moment that he heard the firing gun, the starting gun fire to launch. But where do you launch and what does that look like? Oh, I see it now. 
Can't you imagine the excitement that started to stir in Jesus' heart when he started hearing the reports? He knew John as his relative and his friend. There was something special about him, but oh my goodness, now the Spirit of God is using John. Now there's a movement that's unfolding around him, and Jesus starts feeling drawn to that like a magnet. He's getting pulled into this, this thing of where God is at work, and Jesus is going to join in that, and he's going to launch from that. Now, there's a thousand different ways that that can apply in our lives. I'm not going to chase all of those rabbits. But I, I'll say this just as a for instance. One of the things that's broken my heart countless times in the last few decades is I'll see someone who experiences the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They can't hide it. It just comes out of every part of their bodies when they speak. You see it on their faces. They have just got a second dose of the Holy Ghost. They are on fire. They are in love with Jesus. And they go back home to a dead, dry, dead church. And they are on fire. And they are convinced that they're going to set their church on fire. They're going to change their church. And they've got the best of intentions. They are going to make it happen. And if you check back with them in a year and in five years and in ten years, you know what I've seen time and time and time again? They are still in a dead, dead church. Now, I'm not saying that there is never a circumstance where God's going to set somebody's heart on fire and send them to a dead church and be the spark that ignites the church. It, in theory, can happen. I'm just not sure in my entire life that I've ever seen it. I'll tell you what I think is a much better plan the vast majority of the time. When your heart becomes open to the things of God and the working of the Spirit of God, you need to start opening your eyes and looking around and asking the question, where do I see God at work? Where do I see the Spirit of God being poured out? Where is there an openness to what God wants to do? I want to step into that. I want some of that. And God will birth opportunities to let that spread to other people and to other places. It's part of the reason I am busting a gut to get to Nigeria. I've been to Africa multiple times. The central belt of Africa, revival is like a wildfire being driven by gale force winds. It is spreading like crazy the way lives are being changed, the way people are being won to faith in Christ, miracles being performed. And you may say, oh, well, you're just chasing after the show. No, I'm not. I've seen what happens when you see where God is at work and you, when you have an opportunity to step into that, it spills over on you and it's crazy how much it is like a disease that spreads. You, you catch it and you go back to other places and it's amazing how it spills over from you onto other people. Look for where God is at work. You don't have to go to Africa. God is at work in this place. I look around me. One of the places that I see God so powerfully at work is in these little discipleship groups three or four people who are diving in together they're really pressing in and man something is spreading and people are getting set on fire and they're spreading it to other people look for where god is at work and join him in it that's the key to great impact now, jesus didn't just model these things so that we could admire him he modeled them for us to experience that don't you want that don't you want more spiritual anointing don't you want to see more impact then let's say yes and step into that together. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we are so grateful for what you're doing in our lives. We're grateful for what you're doing in your church. And above everything, we are grateful for the Lord Jesus. Jesus, we want to know you. We want to know you in your fullness. We want to know you in your power. We want to know your tenderness. We want to know your heart. for a fresh revelation of you here. You, you said of yourself, Lord Jesus, that if you be high and lifted up, that you would draw all men and women to yourself. We pray that you would do that among us. I want to invite you. Would you just pray a simple prayer from your heart right now? Jesus, I want to know you better. M maybe you don't even know Jesus in a personal way, and it's just been a, a an idea you've considered that if there is a Jesus, if there is a God, that you'd be curious to know him. Why don't you just tell him that? Maybe you've been a Christian for a really long time, but your heart sure would love a more personal experience with Jesus. Would you tell him that now? I don't want to ask you.
ask you to just pray a very specific prayer now. Would you ask the Spirit of God to show you the one or two things that you could do starting right now that would help you to get to know Jesus better? It might be something as simple as just getting into the Word just a few minutes each day, stepping into a small group, be someone that you're supposed to connect with. It may be a change in your prayer life, uh, something that you're supposed to read, but ask him, how can I get to know Jesus better? It may be that he simply says, be here for the next 15 weeks, press in and see what happens from there. I'm going to ask you today to do a simple thing among us. By the work of your spirit, would you salt our souls to make us thirsty, thirsty and hungry for more of you? And then we're just going to ask you to satisfy that with your presence, with a fresh revelation of you. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.